say two empires, you mean em in general empires in the north and empires in the south? Is that what you mean? Well, the Cholas are deep down south, but, but remember that under the Guptas, you have sufficient penetration into the south, and you're going to have that again to some extent under the Mughals, but partly it has to do with trying to control areas that really extend that far down. Okay, and because you, you, have to, you have to remember that they're also extending further west, and many of these rulers that we're speaking about, including the Delhi Sultanate, now, these are all people who are coming from the Northwest, okay, right? So the Lodhis, for example, are Afghans, right? If you look at the, if you look at the Mughal emperors themselves, I mean, the, their origin is basically what you would describe as Central Asian slash Turkish, right? So they're all coming from further west. And it's obviously going to be easier for them to, to, to start controlling areas from there. You come from that area. You control areas from there on the way to North India, and then you try to extend your control as far down south as you can. But, some, but, but virtually all of them, I mean, if you, if you remember that when I was speaking about Alauddin Khilji, circa 1300, so I'd mentioned that he had tried to conduct extensive campaigns down into the Deccan, deep down into the Deccan. But these campaigns are very expensive, and partly it has to do with the fact that, the cap, the, the, that these, these empires are largely based in the north. But, you know, I did speak about the Vijayanagar Empire, which is, which is a Hindu kingdom down, down south, right? And that's not the Cholas that we're speaking about, because the Cholas are much further south, so the Vijayanagar is further north, or what you would describe as Chola country, right? But I think the, the question that you're, you're asking is a question about you know, is there a, a kind of a political integration of the entirety of India? And there's more, the answer is there's more of a cultural integration. So, this, so that, that's why you have these pan-Indian gods, such as Vishnu and Shiva. And when I say pan-Indian, what I mean by that, obviously, is that they are worshipped all over the country, right? I mean, they may be known by different names very often, but it's the same god. And you're going to find, you're going to find that this is something that is common to all of India. Although if you go east to uh, Bengal, I mean, you would have noticed that we haven't really spoken much about, you know, the far east of the country. And today, if you look at the map of India, there's a whole place which is usually referred to as Northeast India, which includes, so I would urge all of you to look at a map, a contemporary map of India. You can just go to Google or go to one of the books that you have and see if it has one of those maps. And you see it has these states which are called Nagaland, Mizoram, Manipur, Assam, and so on. Okay? Now, th these parts have not been integrated into the history of India at this point in time in the same way. But they appear only, the mention of this, these places only appears very, very sporadically. When, for example, Buddhism is on retreat, is on a retreat, it's going to go further east. Right? And that's where you're going to find some of this history beginning to be integrated. But... To really speak of the integration of India and the manner in which we think of India today, we have to really wait until the 1920th century, you know. Okay? Yeah? Any, any, any further questions? All right. So you will receive your, your uh, papers uh, at the end of class today, and I'm going to end about five minutes early because it's going to take time, obviously, to distribute the papers. Now, uh, let me uh, tell you what the four trajectories are, the four streams that you have to keep in mind. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to, to get to the Europeans today. And when I say the Europeans, I, I'm thinking not only of the English. The English, of course, uh, are going to be our main, con main consideration uh, when we get to this phase of the history for the obvious reason that uh, India is going to fall under British rule uh, beginning in the mid-18th uh, century. Uh, but there is a French presence. There is a Dutch presence. There is obviously a Portuguese presence. The East India Company was founded in 1600. Uh, the Dutch East India Company was founded just a few years later. And then the French East India Company is going to be founded, if I recall, sometime around the 1660s. Okay? But we're going to get to that later. The three trajectories we're interested in are the Mughals, and I'm going to continue my discussion of the Mughals today. We're going to return to the history of the Sikhs, because essentially I had left off at, uh, with the life of Guru Nanak, right? Uh, with the death of Guru Nanak, that's essentially where we had left that history off. And there is interaction, um, an interaction that 
there is a rather bitter memory of, if I may put it this way, between the Mughals and the Sikhs because a number of the Sikh gurus are going to be martyred by, uh, during the Mughal period. Uh, and then we have a third strand, um, which is something that you haven't heard of yet, and, and I'm hoping to get to it today, which is the advent of a man called Shivaji, um, an extremely important figure in the imagination of the country, as you'll see, and the Marathas. All right. Now, uh, I've been talking to you at the point at which I'd stopped. I, you recall that what I had done for you was I had laid out for you what I had described as the pillars of the Mughal Empire. I had enumerated seven or eight principal considerations, you know, the manner in which they were able to hold this huge empire together. Uh, and, uh, and I'd also discussed very briefly the life of Babur, the founder of the Mughal Empire, and his son Humayun, who rules from 1530 to 1540. Um, there is another Afghan uh, leader uh, in India uh, by the name of Sher Shah Suri uh, who is going to conquer Bengal uh, and is going to pose difficulties for Humayun. So Humayun is actually going to have to flee India. The Mughal emperor is going to flee India. Uh, he is going to be out of India for 15 years. Uh, during this period he is also going to convert to the Shia faith. Um, he's going to defeat his own brother. I'm speaking about Humayun here. He's going to defeat his own brother uh, at Kabul uh, and is going to be assisted by the Persians in his attempt to recover India, which he will. So Humayun is going to come back to India and is going to regain the empire for the Mughals in 1555, but he's only going to live for one year after that. And then he's going to be succeeded, and this is now the succession over here, and this is what you should really be thinking about because this is these four together represent you know what would be considered the great period of the Mughals uh, in India and recall this is possibly the greatest centralized state of its time in the world as I said the common comparisons will be, will be done with the other so-called gunpowder empires you know the Safavids in Persia and the Ottomans in Turkey now Akbar has a very long reign. If you look at the, if you look at these dates over here, these are the years that they reign. Uh, and Akbar and Aurangzeb will both rule for 49 years each. So this is a, a very long period of time. When Akbar comes to power, he's uh, in fact actually a young boy. Um, for those of you who are interested also in contemporary Hindi cinema, there is a film called uh, Joda Akbar. Uh, this is one of those you know sort of uh, magisterial Bollywood films, full of color and all of that, you know, great dance sequences, the kind of thing that gives Bollywood its name. Uh, and I, I was asked a question by somebody here uh, at the end of class, you know, whether it was historically true or not, uh, you know, what is represented over there. Well, that's a question that one always asks of these kinds of things. And sometimes there may be other kinds of questions that we may want to ask, but obviously some of that film is based, in fact, on... Uh, you know, what the historical consensus of the day is, right? I don't have time to discuss the film, but it'll give you some insights, not only into the Mughal period, but it'll give you some insights into contemporary Indian culture, right? And how we think of the Mughal period. So I would recommend that you see that film if you can. Now, uh, 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 Akbar, I've talked about him a little bit because these pillars of the empire that I'm talking about, for example, alliances with the Rajputs, Right? Well, this is something that, you know, marrying a Rajput woman. Uh, remember that Akbar is in fact actually a foreigner. Both his parents, okay, are foreigners. And he is the last of the Mughals who is really a foreigner in that sense because we're going to find, you know, Jahangir is going to be born. Uh, he, uh, he, he's, the, he's the offspring or the product of Akbar and his Hindu wife, the, a Rajput woman that he marries. So thereafter, you know, the foreign element, so to speak, is going to be decreased. But there is an increasing indigenization in every respect, as I said, and this is going to greatly accelerate during the time of Akbar. Another small footnote, which is really worth your consideration. Unlike his father and grandfather, who were extremely learned men, I mean, Babur wrote the Babur Nama himself, and as I said, it's written in this Turkish, which is heavily Persianized. Well, according to what the scholars say, because I read neither Persian nor, nor Turkish. Okay, uh, but that's that's the general consensus that I've read about. Uh, that it's written in extraordinary prose, the Babur Nama. Akbar is in fact illiterate. 
completely illiterate. And this is the surprising thing and something for you to think about. Sometimes not being burdened by the knowledge of the books, by bookish knowledge, can in fact liberate you. That's not meant to be a cue for all of you and how you should proceed in this course, all right? But it's certainly the case that Akbar in many ways had a much more tolerant outlook, was much more ecumenical in his worldview, and was open to influences from all over. His mind had not been contaminated and filled with bookish ideas. And so sometimes learning can be a disability. And what Akbar shows is in fact how somebody like him who was illiterate, and it makes us rethink these categories, you know, that we shouldn't assume that people who are illiterate are stupid or that they're not capable of wisdom. They may be capable of greater wisdom for all we know, right? But the important point is precisely this, that even though he's illiterate, he gathers around him people who are extremely learned. He listens to them. So in fact, you know, his court has what is called the Navratna, the nine jewels, you know, uh, including a, uh, uh, for everyone who grew up in South Asia, okay, at least India, would have known the story of Akbar and Birbal. Okay? So check this character out, B-I-R-B-A-L. All right, the stories of Birbal. So Birbal is his extremely wise minister. No matter how difficult a question or riddle you put to him, he'll have the solution for it. So Birbal is one of his nine jewels. Man Singh, the general, the Rajput general. Todermal, the revenue minister. Okay? These are all the people he gathers around him. He brings divines, religious divines, religious personalities representing the different faiths to the court. He wants to listen to what the Hindus have to say, what the Sufis have to say, what the Christians have to say. And in fact, he is going to, this is the common view, he is going to try to create a new eclectic faith, which is called the din e ilahi okay? din e ilahi which is, as I said, a, a, a kind of a new eclectic faith. Um, there's, a, there's a capital that he builds called Fatehpur Sikri. All right, we're going to see slides of that either today or, to, or, or in the next class. Uh, Fatehpur Sikri, it's mentioned in your books. And Fatehpur Sikri, if you go there, so this is now considered a kind of a ghost capital. It's a World Heritage Site, by the way, because it's an extraordinary collection of buildings. Um, and this was a capital that he'd built. It was abandoned shortly after it was built for various reasons. But one of the, if you go to one of the buildings, um, you'll see a pillar there. And in the pillar, you'll see the Om sign, which is the sign that Hindus use. You'll see, you'll see the Star of David, right? And so forth and so on. You'll see the signs of all the different faiths, an indication of the fact that he was interested, as I said, in this kind of eclecticism, religious eclecticism. And he tries to create this kind of faith, which he hopes will merge the best of all the religions together. It's a short-lived experiment. Doesn't really work. But nonetheless, it's a bold attempt, right? So if you had to now think of, the, of Akbar's reign, 1556, 1609, 49 years, right? How do we encompass it, right? I've given you some interesting little bits that he's illiterate, right? He's, but he's interested in learning. Uh, he's a patron of the arts, architecture. Uh, Fatehpur Sikri, by the way, is uh, built, all the buildings are constructed out of a, out of a red sandstone, all right? Um, some of his successors will particularly, as you're going to find out, Shah Jahan, are going to be much more interested in marble rather than in this red sandstone, all right? Um, but what are the sort of major things that we need to think about with respect to his 49-year reign, okay? First, the expansion of the empire. The empire is going to expand even more. So he's able to come a little bit further down in the south, a little further east, okay? all the way to the extremities of Orissa, right? and a little bit south of the Godavari River in the Deccan. Right? The bis one thing that is important to think about is that the business of the Mughal Empire is war. It is a monstrous military machine. We, we, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate that. Uh, John Kay's History of India 
suggests that about 25 million people in India okay, were in some fashion or the other a part of this military machine. That doesn't mean 25 million soldiers. Okay? Several million soldiers. He estimates that the armies together of the Mughal em emperor and including those of all the mansabdars. You remember the system of mansabdars, right? This hierarchical military elite. Yeah, right? And that together this would have amounted to four to six million. And then there are all the other people who are part of this war machine in other ways. Okay? So he estimates about 25 million people, and I need to, by the way, give you a population estimate because we haven't actually really looked at that issue at all, um, among many other things which have been difficult to look at. But the population of India in 1600, so this is um, during the reign of Akbar, is estimated to have been about 140 million. By comparison, the entire British Isles was 5 million, and all of Western Europe would have had about 40 million people at that point in time. So there were about 140 million people. So India has had a large population for a considerable period of time. Out of that 140 million, the estimate is that about 100 million would have been confined to the area between the Himalayan mountains and the Deccan. Okay, so, so north central India, this would have accounted for about uh, 100 million out of the 140 million population. Um, if you read the Babur Nama, uh, he mentions, for example, employing 1,500 stone cutters just in Agra, right, for some of the imperial projects. 1,500 stone cutters. And he says, quote, men of every trade and occupation are numberless and without stint in Hindustan, right? So, I mean, it clearly, not only are we speaking about large populations here, but we're speaking about people who had various kinds of skills. And if the business of the Mughal Empire is war, okay, and war means expansion as well, then you also have to think about the revenue. Okay, where are they collecting the revenue from? And they have a whole system here, right? If, if we have occasion for it, I'll, I'll try to talk about that later on. But I want to stick to the, to the main political narrative at this point in time. So... I'm suggesting to you that you can see these pillars of the Mughal Empire, so to speak, okay, during the reign of Akbar. He forges a system of alliances. Okay. He, he creates a balance between the indigenous elements and the foreign elements. All right. He's going to try to reduce the reliance upon the Turkish elements over a period of time. All right. Uh, and he's also going to create a balance of power in other ways. He eliminates the post of chief minister because his fear is that the chief minister becomes too powerful, bec will become a source of power unto himself. And so what he's going to do is he's going to divide the, the ministerial responsibilities among a number of ministers, all of whom are going to have more or less equal standing in his reign. So minister of revenue, for example, would be one minister of war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. So, so decentralization in some respects. Okay, a balance of power between the regional and the central, a balance of power between the indigenous elements and the foreign elements, a system of alliances, a system of mansabdars. Okay, incorporation of the enemy within your fold. So the enemies that you defeat, which in this case would include Rajput rulers, are going to, many of them are going to be installed as mansabdars at his court. And the alliances are done, as I said, also through marriage. The creation of a new faith, Dine Eli, which points to, of course, his tolerance. The abolition of the jizya. Remember what the jizya is. It's a tax imposed by the Muslim ruler on his non-Islamic subjects. Okay, now he's going to abolish the jizya, right? And the ulema, the Muslim clergy, are going to be quite angry with Akbar because he is seen as somebody who is not a proper Islamic ruler. And recall one of the things that points to that argument, the fact that he confers darshan. Remember, he takes his Hindu practice, right? He comes out in the balcony and confers darshan. Right? His, his subjects can gaze, look at him, and he looks at them, so to speak. Right? And then he's got this architectural legacy. 
And what you also have a Mughal school of miniature painting, which is going to begin to develop in Akbar's time. It had started a little bit earlier. It combines Persian and Rajput elements. And he has a system of forts and fortresses strung throughout North India. Delhi, Agra, Chitor, 1567, Ramthambore, 1569, and so on. Okay? This is how I think you could think, you know, very quickly of this long period of his reign. Right? So it's a period of immense stability, some would argue, but certainly a period which sees India politically united once again. Right? Now, Akbar is going to be succeeded by his son, Jahangir, who's going to rule from 1605 to 1627. One of the things that Jahangir is eminently interested in is gardens. Okay? So you're going to see these Mughal gardens. And if you go to Kashmir, you know, you can still see the Mughal gardens that were created during the time of Jahangir. So he's a patron, again, of uh, the arts. Painting is going to flourish in his time. He's going to be able to maintain the empire. There's not going to be any further expansion, really, during, during the time of Jahangir. But he's going to be able to more or less maintain the empire that Akbar had created. Um, and again, you know, there's going, to be, there's going to be fighting within the family, you know. Uh, his own son, for example, is killed at his command because his son is going to rebel, okay, at the age of 17, right? Now, let me just move momentarily to another trajectory here because one of the things that we're going to find is that Guru Arjun Dev, who's one of the Sikh Gurus, he is going to be executed at the command of Jahangir, all right, for having given aid to his son. So Jahangir's son, Khusro, who tries to lead a rebellion against his father, is going to be given aid by Guru Arjun Dev. At least that was, that was what the view of the Mughals was. Okay? And they're going to therefore execute him. So let me f- now shift my attention for a moment before I get back to the Mughals, to the Sikhs. Okay? So you remember that where we had stopped was the, 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 uh, the death of... Guru Nanak, and uh, as I pointed out to you, there are 10 gurus in the Sikh faith, okay? I'm not going to enumerate all the names. You can find them in, in any, you know, history book and so on, okay? But a number of these figures are of some importance. Um, his immediate successor, Guru Nanak's immediate successor, Angad, who's not related, by the way. So the successor is, this is not like the Mughal succession here at this point in time where, you know, the succession is, you know, somebody within the family, okay? In fact, Angad is not related to Guru Nanak at all, but he's viewed as a successor because he's viewed as the one who is most likely to, you know, keep the faith alive and keep the ideals of Guru Nanak alive. So his successor, Angad, is going to collect the compositions of Nanak and he's going to develop the Gurmukhi script, Right? Now, uh, Guru Ramdas, who lives from 1534 to 1581, he's not on your list yet either. He's going to found the city of Amritsar, okay? which is the holiest site associated with the Sikhs. So that's the site of what is now called the Golden Temple. Um, and it's not the only holy site, obviously. There are many others, but this is the holiest site uh, of the Sikhs. And then you have Guru Arjun Dev. So now we get to Gar- Guru Arjun Dev who lives from 1563 to 1606. He's going to build one of the great Gurdwaras in Amritsar, right? And as I said, he's going to be martyred for having... When I say martyred, he's essentially going to be executed by the the orders of Jahangir, all right? Now, uh, the Guru Granth Sahib, right, which is the name of the holy book, it's also known as the Adi Granth, the original Granth, Okay, this is going to start to take shape at this time, right? It's been taking shape over a period of a hundred years, and there are all these compositions in it, some of which I described to you very briefly in a previous lecture. Okay, but it's begin it's beginning to take shape around the time of Guru Arjun Dev. Okay, and then if we go a little bit further, so now I'm moving further ahead during the t- as far as the history of the Sikhs are concerned during the time of Aurangzeb, because I want to actually finish this particular trajectory here. That is the history of the Sikhs. So the ninth guru is Guru Teg Bahadur. And essentially the story there is quite the same. That is that he is going to be brought before the emperor Aurangzeb 
and he's going to be told that you have to convert to Islam. He refuses to do so, he's going to be martyred. His son, Guru Gobind Singh, okay, 1666 to 1708, the last of the Sikh gurus, okay, the last of the Sikh gurus, the idea being that after his death, the holy book itself should be viewed as the guru. Because what is the guru? The guru is your spiritual guide. He's your spiritual mentor, right? So in place of the guru, there is the book. But I need to say quite a bit, or at least something about Guru Gobind Singh. Because what we understand as Sikhism today owes as much to Guru Gobind Singh as it does to Guru Nanak. All right? That's the reason why he is an important figure. Right? Now, he is going to be... Uh, he's going to be appointed the successor, and he's still a young boy when, when this happens. At this point in time, so we're speaking about the 1670s, there is but no question that there is persecution going on of Sikhs and Hindus, okay, under the Mughal emperor. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that question in a few minutes when I return to my trajectory on the Mughals. But there is no question, as I said, that there is some persecution going on, some oppression here religious oppression. All right. Now, one of the concerns that the Sikh community has is that in times of persecution, there is always the danger that the Sikh will relapse back into Hinduism. Because who are the Sikhs? Who is Guru Nanak? Guru Nanak was born in a Hindu family. Right? This is a constant problem in the history of Sikhism, I want to suggest to you. A problem that exists in some fashion or the other down to the present day. That is that when you try to define a Sikh, we run into a bit of a problem. And we run into a bit of a problem because if you say that, for example, that the Sikhs are a monotheistic people, okay, and if you look at the Guru Granth Sahib, well, it has compositions by various people, including, for example, Kabir, who would also be venerated among the Hindus. The problem is that in a certain manner of speaking, everything that the Sikhs believe in is believed in by some Hindu sect or the other. Okay? This is the classic problem of Hinduism sort of absorbing everything. Right? How do you actually distinguish a Sikh from a Hindu. So let's supposing you removed all the signs, the external symbols. There are external symbols. All right? Let's supposing you removed all the external symbols. Would you be able to distinguish a Sikh from a Hindu, so to speak? Okay? Now, the reason why this is important is that Guru Gobind Singh, as he grows into maturity, in, from his adolescent years, moves into youth, adulthood, and really becomes the leader of the community, he's faced with this question, how do we preserve the Sikh community in the face of oppression? And how do we preserve the Sikh community from being reabsorbed back into Hinduism? The persecution of Sikhs is greater than the persecution of Hindus, partly because the Hindus have the advantage and the security of numbers. The Sikhs are much smaller in numbers, particularly at that point in time. And this is what I mean, there's the fear of relapsing back okay, into Hinduism. Because you, you are now under the umbrella of a large community, there's less chance of being persecuted than if you're a Sikh. But there's another reason why the Sikhs are persecuted more. Because the Sikhs offer competition to the Muslims, because it's a monotheistic faith, you see. Right? The Hindus are not viewed as being in competition as such. They're simply infidels, right? But the Sikhs are a monotheistic faith. That's a bit of a problem for the Muslim rulers because you've got competing faiths here which can claim this mantle, all right? So the story, and again, I don't frankly care whether it's apocryphal or not because it's a fantastic story and it tells you something about the origins of what we today really know as Sikhism is that Guru Gobind Singh will call a meeting of the entire community and will say that, look, you know, we're being cowardly. Some of us are converting back to Hinduism. Some of us are running away in the face of this persecution. We need to stand up to this persecution. And what I want to create is I want to create a brotherhood of the pure. The, the word for that is Khalsa. 
I want to create a brotherhood of the, of the pure, people who are going to be absolutely valiant, courageous, full of fortitude, and they're going to be willing to stand up for to oppression. And to see if I can build up this Khalsa, what I want, he says, to the community, it's a large meeting, I want five men to come forward right now who are willing to give up their lives at this very instant for me, for the guru. I am your guru. Now, you know, who's going to volunteer to come forward? And, and just to make sure that there's no mistake about what's going on, he's got this huge sword, right, okay, next to him. So the idea is that whoever is going to come forward, well, they're going to get beheaded, right? The five people who are willing to give up their lives, right? So, you know, there's uh, nobody steps forward for a period of time, and, you know, he keeps on haranguing them, and then finally a man steps forward, and he says, I'll give up my life for you, for the guru, all right? So right next to where Guru Gobind Singh is standing, he is, there's a little tent. He takes this man inside the tent, and nobody outside knows what's going on. All they can hear is they hear a thud. They hear a kind of a noise or something falling, and Guru Gobind Singh steps out of the tent, and his sword is dripping with blood. Now, all of you would have arrived at the same conclusion that everybody else would have when they first heard the story, namely that this man has been beheaded. All right? But remember, he has asked for five volunteers. Now he says, I want a second volunteer. Now, of course, there's even greater reluctance to step forward, right? because it's quite clear what your fate is at this point in time. But to cut a very long story short, he gets a second volunteer. The same thing happens. He takes his man inside this tent, and he comes out. You know, and the sword is again dripping with blood. Then again, the sword is cleaned. Then a third man comes, a fourth man comes, then the fifth man comes. Then he takes a fifth man there. Moments later, he steps out of the tent with all the five men and five goats that have been beheaded. Okay? Five goats that have been beheaded. Now, these five are going to be called the Panj Piare. The Panj Piare means the five beloved. Okay, the five beloved of the faith. These are going to be the core of what is called the Khalsa, right? Which is the brotherhood of the pure, but it's also, I don't think it would be an inaccurate way to put it, a more militant form of Sikhism. Sikhism, that part of Sikhism which is sworn to defend the faith. Okay, the Khalsa is going to become exceedingly important in the development of Sikhism. Right? But it's going to acquire that kind of, as I said, a more militant tone, parts of Sikhism, from the time of Guru Gobind Singh. Guru Gobind Singh is also going to institute a number of other kinds of rules and regulations. The langar which had already commenced under the time of Guru Nanak is going to be institutionalized. There's going to be a ban on the consumption of tobacco and alcohol. Okay? Right? And so on and so forth. This is what I mean that there's going to institute a certain kinds of certain kinds of rules and regulations. What he's really doing is he's baptizing the people of the Khalsa because of course eventually others will join the Khalsa. Others will join the Khalsa. He's baptizing them into essentially what is a new faith. Okay? Then he's going to create these panj kakke. Panj kakke is the five symbols of the faith. Okay? Many people think that the turban is one of them. It is not. The turban actually becomes important in Sikhism much later, under colonial rule. There's a long history of that. Okay? But hair is important. Kesh. Kesh is one of them. That you have to, males are enjoined to keep their hair long and unkept. Okay? But to control it, there is something called a kang, which is the comb, and so on. I'm not going to go through the list here. Okay? Right? But what we're saying is that these are the external symbols of the faith. And now the question therefore becomes again, what if you remove the symbols of the faith? What are the real religious differences, you know, between the Hindus and the Sikhs? And you know that in the Punjab, in the 20th century, before political problems in the Punjab began to develop in 1984, right? And before that, a few years before that, because in 1984, there's going to be a, an assault on the Golden Temple. And really, assault, that's what it is, on the Golden Temple by the Indian Army. 
because they're going to be secessionists. Some of the Sikhs want to create a separate nation state called Khalistan. So there's a secessionist movement. And some of these secessionists are going to be holed up in the Golden Temple. And the Indian government is going to try to negotiate with them. The negotiations really don't work at all. So eventually they have to flush them out by, in fact, having an assault on the Golden Temple, which is the most sacred shrine okay, of the Sikhs. It's a very controversial, very troubled period. The 1970s, early 1980s, all the way, in fact, until I would say around 1990s, early 1990s. Okay? But the reason why this is important here is because if you look at that period, you find out that the Khalsa Sikhs, the Orthodox Sikhs, were killing not just Hindus, they were killing moderate Sikhs. The Sikhs who had abandoned the symbols of the faith. A Sikh who became a Mona Sikh. Mona Sikh is somebody who cuts his hair. You know, so looks, let's say, like me. Okay? You know, doesn't wear a turban, doesn't have a long beard. Okay? Removes the external symbols. Mona Sikhs were targeted as much as Hindus were by the Orthodox Sikhs. So for Sikhs, this became very important. The external symbols of the faith. But then you have to ask, well, what is a religion about? Is it about external symbols or is it about something else? All right, so that's, those are fragments of a story which I just want you to keep in mind. What The important thing here is that there is going to be tension between the Mughals and the Sikhs. Okay, and a number of the Sikh gurus, as I said, are going to be martyred at the hands of the Mughal emperor. All right. And it's an important story because it tells us something about religious tensions between them. And as I said, this is a slightly different story than the story of Hindus and Muslims here because here we have two monotheistic faiths and the anxiety on the part of the Mughals is really intense. No question about it. Okay. Let me now get back to the story of the Mughals. Right. So I was talking to you about, I'd finish with Jahangir. He's going to be succeeded by his son, Shah Jahan, who rules from 1627 to 1658. Shah Jahan is, means ruler of the world. They were not modest, by the way, about who they were. Um, Aurangzeb is Alamgir, you know, the great world conqueror, right? Okay, they, they all have titles like that, right? And I suppose they were entitled to them, considering what their status was at that point in time. He leaves behind an extraordinarily rich Shah Jahan, an extraordinarily rich architectural legacy. The most well-known example of that is the Taj Mahal. Okay? Um, but he also builds a capital called Shah Jahanabad, named after him. So if you've been to Delhi, what is called Old Delhi, right? parts of that Old Delhi, including the Red Fort, the Jama Masjid, right? This is all built under Shah Jahan. Um, Shah Jahan is going to be known really in a way principally for that, is the rich architectural legacy. Of course, he's able to retain the empire intact. I mean, if he had only had a rich architectural legacy and nothing else, it would have been a problem. And of course, you also have to think about how this rich architectural legacy was funded. The Taj Mahal took something like 20 years to build. Now you're going to have to exact enormous amounts of revenue. And remember, it's in marble, right? And this is maybe, maybe we should see a few slides now. Is it uh, set up, Arlen? Yeah, yeah, that, that I'll take care of, yeah. So we're just going to spend five minutes seeing a few slides and that'll be the end of class today. Oh yeah, it's, it's over here, inside. So it's called, uh, uh, no, no, here. It's called uh, 9A Part 2. Yeah. Okay? Oh, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me say a couple more things while, while we wait for the, the, the slides to, to come up. So as I said, a rich architectural legacy. You have to think about how the Taj Mahal is funded. Okay? Where is the revenue coming from? Right? Uh, and there is obviously an interesting after history of the Taj Mahal as well. So, for example, during this time, in the 1980s, when you had the Sikh secessionist movement, there was an enormous fear that the Taj Mahal was going to be blown up. I mean, there were actually days when the Taj Mahal was not accessible to anybody, even though it's one of the two or three major tourist 
uh, revenue earners um, in India. Okay, right? So this is what you want to keep in mind very broadly that Shah Jahan is able to, as I said, maintain, consolidate the empire, but he also has this immense rich architectural legacy. Again, paintings, all of that. He's a patron of the arts, right? And who is the Taj Mahal built for? It's built for, um, it's built for uh, Mumtaz Mahal, the, his, uh, his queen, who dies in childbirth in 1629. There are quite a few other sort of apocryphal stories that have been built around the legend of Shah Jahan. One of the stories is that you know, there was an intention to build a, another Taj Mahal, which would be e exactly the same, but in black marble which is going to be across the Yamuna, okay, right? And, but one thing we do know is that Shah Jahan is actually going to be, he's going to be imprisoned, by the way, by one of his own sons, and he's going to be put in the fort, and from a little window on the fort, he can see this great monument that he's built for his wife, all right? I mean, so those are, those are some of the kinds of stories that are associated with the Taj Mahal. The lights? No, the, the projector itself. Oh, it's, it's not come out, is it? Ah, okay. All right. Um, let me see. It's, it's, it's well, we, we'll have, yeah, we, we'll, have, we'll have to do it. We'll have to do it on, we'll have to do it on, on, on Friday. Yeah. And yeah, I think that we probably, you have to return papers, so we probably will. We're probably, we're going to end, as I said, a few minutes early today so that you can uh, get your papers back. All right? Uh, and if anybody has any questions about the papers or anything, you can uh, come see me on Friday during my office hours, 11 to 12.